Okay, so let's talk about a couple of key sociological theories that you'll need to know this semester. So what is a theory? A theory is an unproven explanation for events or behaviors from assumptions gained from observing general patterns. So we have theories about a lot of things, about most things. For instance, if I were to ask the question, are athletes treated differently than non-athletes on campus? My guess is that many people would say yes. But if I were to ask you, why does that happen? You would probably have different explanations for why you think the way you think. You would see that athletes are visible, they're representatives of our campus. And because of that, they are held to a higher standard and they're recognized. And so they are treated differently. The reason why we think that occurs is the theory. And so why do we need theories? Um, theories guide our thinking, right? They help us sort of look in the right direction for explanations as to why things occur. It helps us focus attention on specific factors. So if we think about why athletes are treated differently and we wanna do some research on it, then we are gonna focus on looking at those specific factors to help guide our research. So here we have a list of the main sociological theories for this class. The first two are the most important, right? So these are the two that were gonna be used pretty much every single week. So functionalism thinks sport is good. Um, the functionalist perspective um, thinks sport is a very positive thing for society, right? It helps preserve the status quo, Sport is symbolic of the American way of life. So if you think about American values, we love competition, individualism, achievement, fair play, all those things. And so functionalists think sport is, is the American way. From the functionalist perspective, we also focus on the benefits of youth sport. And we'll get into this when we talk about youth sport, but why do parents make their kids play sport? It's probably because they think that sport you know, helps them to develop important characteristics, some discipline, excellence, things like that. So sport focuses on the positives. It promotes patriotism. So the Olympics is a really good example of this. You know, every four years for those two weeks, everyone is rooting for the USA. And it's really fun, right? It gives you feelings of unity and purpose and brings people together. And so this idea that if you challenge this idea that sport is good and say, no, it's not. You're challenging society and its social order. So functionalists view society as a living organism and it requires all these social institutions to work together in order to maintain society, right? It requires these three Cs, consensus, cohesion, cooperation. And sport is a part of that, right? We need it along with government, along with education, and economy. We need it all working and functioning together in order to keep society running and in harmony. So from a conflict theory perspective, we're looking at more of what many people perceive to be the negative. It's focused on disharmony and focused on instability and disruption. Here we're focusing on what pulls us apart. And so conflict theorists think that sport is not good for society. It creates conflict. And so as much as many of us love sport, having this perspective is really important. It's important for us to see that sport isn't always good, that the way people behave because of sport is not always positive. And so the textbook takes more of a conflict theory perspective on all of these issues. So one of the fundamental things in conflict theory is this inequality of income is a problem, right? It, it creates the split between the rich and the poor, the advantaged and the disadvantaged. And so this third piece says that social order reflects the interest of the powerful. It's presumed that sport only reflects and reinforces those who are already in power. And then the second side over here says that sport inhibits revolution by saying that sport basically reinforces capitalism. It distracts people from more of the real problems in life, right? So they tend to spend money 
even though they may be in debt or live in poverty or don't have a job. And it gives a false hope of upward social mobility. And we'll go into that quite a bit, but essentially it's saying that people think that if they get into sport, that they will be able to get away from poverty and move up the social ladder. We'll see that in a couple chapters, but we will see that that is not the case at all. All right, we're gonna look at just a couple more theories um, really briefly. And so hegemony theory focuses on the dominant political, economic, and cultural patterns that influence society. So it's really looking at sport as a cultural practice. And so they tend to agree with functionalists, um, especially in the idea that help, that sport helps to socialize youth, right? But if you really think about it, what sort of youth group is sport actually helping? Usually it's kids who live in suburban wealthy neighborhoods, they are the ones receiving the benefits from playing sport. Those who live in urban, low socioeconomic status areas um, are probably not getting these same benefits. Youth is not reaping the socializing benefits that other dominant groups are experiencing in the same way, mainly because they probably have more of the resources coaches who are trained and understand what they're doing with the youth. Really, we see sport in this context as being only beneficial to, again, those dominant, those dominant groups. Okay, next we have feminist theory. Um, these theories began as critiques of the dominant theories that didn't include women or take women issues seriously. Um, it's advocating for women and basically pointing out the discrepancies in, in opportunities for women, right? They're, they're usually saying that sport is a gendered activity where men have all the power and there's a lot of stereotypes and discrimination against women's sports. And with, within that system, women have fewer opportunities and they're experiencing lots of forms of oppression. You can simply just look at the pay scale, right, of women across many of the occupations and many of the sports, um, there's definitely unequal representation. And so that's a clear, clear example of, of this oppression. Next, we have race theory. And so we see that racism is entrenched in and permeates throughout social institutions. And that definitely includes sport. So, you know, there's a white majority that is profiting from sport and thus that is allowing racial prejudice and discrimination to keep going. Because these white males are in positions of power, they are able to maintain that discrimination against people of other races. And this last one is interactionist theory. And this one's more about social construction. Um, it's about interpretations of meaning and objects that people give to their lives. In this case, sports, sport rituals, and placing personal meaning in that. And so there's sort of this interaction with people and how we learn and culture. And so people learn how to define reality from other people and by learning, learning their culture, right? So whoever controls the context of reality is who is in power. Okay, so that's it for today. I will see you all again next week.